Okay, you can hear me. Welcome to the rest of the Book of Amos. We will not be able to cover everything, of course, because it's a, a lot of material, a full nine chapters, but we will get some uh, sprinkling uh, of uh, ideas from Amos to see a little bit of the theology that happens in the book. Yesterday we stopped at, uh, well, we, we spent a long time on the prologue because as you saw, it had a lot of messages and a lot of uh, samples of his poetry in us to see in those two verses. But now we will go to the section that is called the oracles against the nations. So Amos begins his first two chapters by these oracles addressing other nations, not Israel for the moment. So he begins uh, with the Syrians, he begins with the Philistines, the Phoenicians, the Edomites, the Ammonites. Um, in each of these oracles against the nations, there is the same pattern that is followed in the way that he expresses himself. I will not read all of them, <laughs> of course, but I, I will read a little bit uh, of, the, um, of the beginnings of the oracles so that you can see the same pattern. So, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hazael and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. Philistines now, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they ca carried into exile entire communities to hand them over to Edom. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. So you're hearing this pattern that continues. And uh, this, uh, this model can be described as uh, a pattern of X and X plus one, three and for four. So let's uh, put it in this equation, X and X plus one. This is um, a pattern that we see a lot in the wisdom literature, especially in the book of Proverbs. We find this way of expression, like this uh, verse here, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. So you see, uh, it escalates, the number escalates. So it expresses some kind of escalation. And while we could say three transgressions are enough, for God to uh, condemn these nations, to condemn Tyre, to condemn Aram and all of these uh, nations that he describes, then he puts in there a fourth one, which means that they went over and above the allowance that God was patient to give them. So in some sense, while three would be a completion of the transgression that they were allowed to do, they went up to four, so for three and for four, I will not revoke the punishment. So Amos prophesies against eight nations in total in a geographic um, chiastic structure. Uh, I put the numbers here so you can see um, how this lion that roars jumps from nation to nation, attacking all of them and forming some kind of chiastic structure as he attacks. So first of all, you see number one here, it's Syria, Aram, Aram is Syria. So he begins with Syria here in number one in the northeast, and then he jumps to Gaza. Gaza is down here, Philistia, the Philistines. So the lion jumps from one to two, going uh, south, southwest. And from southwest, now he will go up to Tyre. He will jump up to Three here, Phoenicia, Tyre. So this is the next jump of the lion going up again and now to form a chia, an X, chiastic structure, he will jump down to Edom right here. All the time you can see that he's bypassing Israel. He's jumping over Israel, he doesn't land on it. So Israel is happy so far because it's not, he's not being mentioned. So he goes down to Edom and then Ammon, 
up here and then Moab up here and then what does he do? He's getting a bit closer to Israel. He's going to Judah and Judah is okay. We're separate kingdoms. We're not in excellent terms so we don't mind if uh, uh, the prophet, if the lion roars against Judah. It's okay but this is very very close to Israel and what number is Judah? Uh, it's number seven. So okay, it's the number of completion. The oracles against the nations are completed. Seven oracles, seven nations. We can rest now. We are fine and we support Amos. We support all his oracles. He is right to condemn all these nations. And when they least expect it, the lion jumps up to Israel and the oracle, uh, the eighth oracle is against Israel. It's a very clever rhetorical structure that Amos is using with his prophecies and precisely because he has the audience with him. He goes to Bethel, he goes to the northern kingdom and he's yelling against their enemies. Of course they're applauding, they're saying yes, tell it, preach it. You know, they surely agreed and shake their heads as they're listening to him because all these transgressions, all this, and you saw, um, we haven't read everything, but you see the transgressions, they're very brutal. They go into other people's territories. They uh, tear, uh, they, they slaughter pregnant women. They uh, take captive populations and they sell them as slaves. They do very, very brutal things. And these transgressions, these war crimes that they are accused of, they deserve to be punished. So yes, we are with Amos. The word that is used for these betrayals is the word uh, Pesha. I don't think I, let me see if I put it here. No, I haven't. But the word Pesha comes from this area of international politics. It's a, it's a transgression, it's an international crime, let's say. It's a war crime, rather. It's a betrayal of the agreements, of the international agreements that one nation makes with another. So we saw this uh, nations um, being attacked, reaching eighth, which is Israel. So um, by reaching seven, uh, they must have thought, okay, Judah is the worst. Okay, they are idolaters, he li leaves them for last, but they could not imagine that this lion who's supposed to be with them, their ally, their defender, and fights for them, they could not have imagined that he would have left the worst for last. But wait a minute, the crimes that were described for all of these people, they were really brutal, large-scale war crimes. Amos will not accuse Israel for these kinds of crimes. He's going to accuse them of what they may have thought are minor things, like cheating their neighbor, oppressing the poor, enslaving another person. These are not like huge scale war crimes. But Amos, by listing Israel together with these people, by having the same punishment, uh, declared against Israel, what does this tell us? That he does not discriminate between people, but also that he puts this um, apparent smaller crime, inner, uh, na not international, but inside their own nation, little crime. He puts it on the same scale with these large uh, war crimes, large international crimes. So now this, uh, you saw this repetitive, uh, what is the value of this repetitive structure, this repetitive pattern? Three and four, I will not relent. Three and four, I will not relent. Three and four, I will not relent. It creates an anticipation. Uh, and especially when you're preaching it very loudly, people are waiting to see what happens, waiting to see for the climax. And the climax is that the lion formed by his attacks a web by his pattern, a web that trapped Israel in its midst. Now, Israel, by being the eighth, means that he went over and beyond what was 
allowed by Yahweh, not was what was tolerated by Yahweh, we could say. So in this oracle, God begins by reminding them, in the oracle against Israel, he begins by reminding them of their history, which is what incriminates them the most. Because their history means that God was with them, he fought for them, he defended them, he gifted them with the land and everything else, but they stopped listening. He tells them in his oracle that you muted your prophets. You told your prophets to stop prophesying. So once you stop hearing the call of God, the word of God, then you begin to be hardened and you begin not to recognize what you're doing wrong. Now, uh, let's go back to these nations now. Um, the, these nations don't really have a direct relationship with Yahweh like Israel has. So what gives Amos the right to condemn these other nations along with Israel? Why these other nations are accountable to Yahweh? This is what is presupposed here, right? If Yahweh comes and says, I will punish this nation for their sins, what is presupposed, what is implied? That this nation is also accountable to Yahweh for their sins just like Israel is. Even though they never received the Torah, they never received the law in Mount Sinai, yet they are somehow considered, by the words of Amos, they're considered accountable. However, in the ancient world, every nation was accountable to their own God, right? Every nation had their gods. There was no God who would complain why this other nation disobeyed their own God. It's none of my business, let their God deal with them, right? So this is very peculiar that we see a God, the God of Israel, having trouble why these guys disobeyed their own rules, their own agreements. They broke their own covenants of brotherhood, as um, he says to Edom. So what does this presuppose in the mind of the prophet? It presupposes monotheism. It presupposes that Yahweh is the God of all the nations. Otherwise, Yahweh would not bother with these other nations. So they are his crea creation. They are also his children in another sense that is not evident yet to Israel. What is this relationship with the other nations? We will see at the end of the book how this gets clarified because we have a great vision about the future of the nations there. But now, this is what we must see. He presupposes that these nations are brothers and sisters. They should not have been doing crimes against each other. This is very interesting. When we study political treaties and political international agreements between ancient nations, we see that these nations had certain rules. For example, in the Hittite treaties, there are rules regarding how wars should be conducted. You couldn't just go to war against another and not follow any rules. There were rules about what you should do during a war, what is uh, ethical contact in a war, what you should do with captives, how you are to treat captives. There were international agreements about these things. And it looks, uh, it looks like this was enough for God to condemn them. He's not condemning them because they are following another God. He's not condemning them for idolatry. This is what he would do to Israel and Judah. But to these guys, these other nations, he's condemning them on the basis of their own rules. He's condemning them on the basis of their own ethic. They are also not following their own ethic, their own covenants, their own agreements and dedications to obey certain rules. So when we ask ourselves, why should God condemn someone who's never heard of them? There is enough ground for, some, for, for people to be condemned on the basis of their own ethic is enough. You don't need to have the law of Sinai uh, to be condemned by Yahweh. And this is something we also find in the Apostle Paul. 
Paul recognizes the general revelation that uh, God has given to all the nations. We can see in Romans 1, 18 to 21, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. They know right and wrong. Even since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. And just like Amos does, the Apostle Paul begins with the nations in the letter to the Romans and ends up with the judgment of Israel. He's using a similar technique that Amos is using, saying, therefore, you have no excuse. First, he's speaking about the nations, and now the Jews listening to Paul, they would cheer, yes, it's true, look at what they're doing, look at the, all their transgressions. They would cheer and agree with Paul, but now he comes to them, he's, he's coming close to home. He sings, therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is in accordance with truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? What is different with Paul than Amos? He's doing the same thing. You think that you will escape the judgment of God. And you look at the others and you condemn the others. So what is Paul saying? That there is no discrimination in God. Everyone has failed. The Gentiles have failed. And the Jews have failed. So everybody, both Jew and Gentile, is in need of Christ. Is in need of repentance. He's not saying all this because he wants to destroy all of them. He's saying all this because he wants everyone to repent and come to him. Now, what about Israel? Okay, we saw the other nations. They're condemned on the basis of their own laws and agreements and covenants. But what about Israel? What is the basis on which they are judged? Now, like uh, we mentioned yesterday a little bit, that when we read these uh, harsh texts, let's try to discern what is it, what is it that triggers the wrath of God? What is it that triggers his judgment? And we will see here in the oracle against Israel, what is it that causes him to get angry with them, to condemn them? Let's see the oracle to them. It's a part of it, of course, it's much bigger. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink wine, bought with fines they imposed. Okay, here, all this list of accusations is a total of seven actions that he's condemning. Sale of the righteous for silver, sale of the needy for sandals, financial oppression of the poor, disregard for the poor, sexual exploitation, abused pledges, abused fines. Now, in 2.6, in verse 6, we see uh, financial greed and how financial greed resulted in the commodification of humans. Commodification means you're treating a human as a commodity, as a good to buy and sell. So monetary value has been assigned to human beings, namely the righteous and the needy, as the text tells us. 
The Israelites are selling them for silver and for a pair of sandals. This is the price. Now, the exchange rate of a pair of sandals, what is this? It is mentioned here. Why? Why would he bother to mention for a pair of sandals? What does this show? It shows the cheapness, the <laughs> how, how low uh, of a value they have given to these people, to the needy. And we have another text from the prophet Joel that uh, tells us a similar uh, situation and you cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes and sold girls for wine and drank it down okay this is what gets God angry are we okay with God getting angry for these things <laughs> okay okay so far we're with him good we're glad somebody's getting angry for these things now in the book of Leviticus, it tells us that there are some times, there may be occasions when the poor, uh, when somebody becomes poor, okay, and they cannot afford anything and they are forced to sell themselves uh, because of poverty, they are forced to sell themselves to fellow Israelites so that they can repay their debt. But there is a law that safeguards them and says, no, they are not your commodity. They are protected, okay? You have to treat them as employees, not as slaves. And they have to be freed after seven years and definitely at the Jubilee, okay? So this is Leviticus 25 and many other texts also speak about this. So it is, they serve, they can serve temporarily if they fall into poverty. So it was permitted for Israelites to purchase slaves from foreigners, not from within Israel, not their fellow Israelites. They could purchase slaves. Now we hear this word purchase slaves and it has very bad connotations for us because we have seen the slavery in the US, right? How people were lynched, how they were hanged from trees, how all of this, we have all these bad images, but if you read the laws about slavery and how they're supposed to treat their slaves, it was so much more humane than what we've seen in our modern history. So yes, they are allowed to buy slaves from foreign nations. Uh, they are permitted to sell someone from that they uh, got as a captive, um, there is a law in Deuteronomy that says, okay, when you are in war and you see a girl from this other nation, from the captives, and you want to marry her, okay, you can marry her. But then if you divorce, you don't have the right to sell her. She was your wife. So this tells us that they were not, they, they had no right to treat people as commodities, even the foreigners they, they captured. So there were various regulations to control this. Now, um, you remember how bad it looks when Joseph's brothers sell him as a slave. So this is one story that should, they should know about, and they know about. They know these stories of their patriarchs, and they know what it means to sell your fellow Israelite as a slave. Uh, so it was something that was really bad, it was very much frowned upon, but yet they were doing it. Who are the righteous in this case? Who are the righteous? The only place where we have this mention, righteous, is in another verse also in Amos in, five, uh, in 512. And it, uh, it's, it comes in parallelism with the needy, the righteous and the needy. They always go like a couple, and people think that the righteous here means the innocent, people who are innocent. You're not doing this to them because of a crime or something. So these are the righteous. So now who is selling the righteous and the needy? They're not selling themselves into debt slavery. This was allowed. This was part of their law. They're not selling themselves. So how could someone sell a fellow Israelite? 
Well, we have a law in Exodus 21.16 and Deuteronomy 24.7 which, which gives us a picture when an Israelite could sell another Israelite when they kidnap them. People in Israel could kidnap, they, they were not permitted, but they did. They would kidnap someone and sell them. So this is a clear trafficking case. So there, the possibility here is that they would do that. They would kidnap pe poor people or children and sell them as slaves. And these children must have been orphans. They must have been children, uh, people without any support, any, any house, any relatives who could defend them behind them. So you can see what is happening. Who's going to stand up for these kids? Who is going to defend these people? The God of the orphan and the widow. He's the one who's going to get angry for them. So what we have here is what, what is revealed here is uh, an operation of slavery, of slave trade, of trafficking going on here. And in 8.6, we have the reverse of this action. There's, here's some Israelites thinking that Ah, when will the time come that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the refuse of the wheat? So here we have buy. Okay, so what is condemned? Is it only the sale that's condemned? Is it only the seller that is condemned? No, the buyer is also condemned. Why? Because the buyer could say, I didn't know he was kidnapped. Why should I pay for anything? I am not culpable. No, you too, you have not investigated. You have not asked who it is you're buying. You have not asked where, how is this person enslaved. You have not investigated into this case. So the buyer and the seller taken together, they are both condemned. This is a huge topic in today's world. It was treated back then in Amos time. But today, we have um, many, uh, in our societies are accusing unethical companies for selling products that are products of slavery, of child labor, and all of that. You must have uh, seen this happen. You must have uh, read articles or heard the news. And people are condemning these companies for doing this. And they are trying to establish fair trade. But many of us, we hide behind the identity of the ignorant consumer. Oh, it's on our shelf. I just bought it. I didn't ask, okay, what is this company? How, how come it's so cheap, this product? Where did it come from? So people are now beginning to get more and more alert about where are my products coming from? So this is something that Amos himself, God himself already said, be alert, the seller and the buyer are, uh, should, should be aware and they're both culpable. Now when we come to the sale of bodies, now in the realm of, of human trafficking, this is one of the most serious problems in the world. Uh, it's the third most profitable trade in the world after guns and drugs the sale of humans, either for labor or sex trafficking. Now, uh, in, in most countries, the criminalization of this business of trafficking is against the one who sells. Okay, so it's always the one who's condemned is, is the trafficker. The one who's condemned is the pimp. And also the women who offer service of prostitution. Never is the customer buying it condemned or persecuted, uh, prosecuted, sorry. But certain uh, countries in the last few years started criminalizing the customer. So countries such as Sweden, Norway, Canada, France, and Ireland. So you, you can see they started the criminalization of the buyer and many other countries are following them. But you see, this was so old. 
And we are just now beginning to wake up to it and see that both parties are just as culpable because it's, it's the buyer who creates the demand for it. It's the buyer who creates the demand for these crimes. Now, the discussion brings us to 2-7. Uh, we have, okay, the trembling on the head of the poor, which shows the financial oppression and the absolute disregard of the poor. Nobody even pays attention to them to make their situation better. But then we get to a case of sexual exploitation. Father and son go in the same girl so that my holy name is profane. Now, we see here a girl who is utilized solely for the sexual pleasure of this man, son and father. She's not said to be married to any of them, so she doesn't have the protection of any husband here. And so there's no obligation assumed towards this girl. I'm just using her and abandoning her. But what do we see here? What is really amazing here, it's noteworthy to see that the holiness of God's own name is directly associated with the honoring of this sexually exploited girl. God says, so that my holy name is profane. Where is his name? His name is something independent in the heavens? No, his name has been assigned, stuck, identified completely with this girl and every time you profane this girl you're profaning his name this is the association of Yahweh with this victim right here a teenage girl this is our God and this is so typical of our God who always associates with the poor and the needy he always identifies with the lowest of the low who will get angry for this girl does she have any hope? Will anyone hear her if she screams, if she does anything? No, she has no defender. Yahweh, only him will get angry for this. Finally, we have people completely desensitized, even in their own religion, in their own cult. Now we will uh, see how they continue to carry on with their cultic engagements, with their worship. And the, uh, the, the text here says they can combine their cult. It's not like they abandoned the church and went to do these things. No, they can combine it very well. They combine the cult with their inhumane withholding of pledges from the poor. It says the text here, they impose fines. But the law forbids charging interest when lending money to the poor. It forbids this in Exodus 22, 25, for example. It also forbids someone to hold a pledge when you get the garment of someone, you cannot hold it overnight. You can hold it for a few hours, just like a guarantee. When someone tells you, okay, okay, I'm gonna give you the money. Here's my clock. You can hold it until I bring it to you, but you have to give it back before sunset because this is the only thing that this person has to cover themselves at night. What are they doing? They are the ones lying down on, on these pledges, on these garments that they took pledge beside their altars. So this is why here um, Amos is condemning this. And we will see an example, uh, an archaeological uh, find that shows a person complaining that this is happening to them. Um, there is complete disregard, complete disregard of how the pledges, the fines, this behavior is affecting the poor in their midst. Now, archaeologists, like uh, uh, we said, they discovered an ostracon. Ostracon is a clay shard in Yavne Yam, which is in the south of Tel Aviv. And it's dated about a century after the time of Amos. So this behavior continues, of course. And on this ostracon, we find written a request of some farmer 
who's addressing the governor of his town, of the area, and he's complaining that his cloak was confiscated and it was taken from him because of his inability to pay his debt. Your servant was threshing, work went as usual, your servant has completed the threshing part he was responsible for and stored the produce, despite that fact, Osiahu, son of Sobai, withheld your servant's overcoat. Please give instructions to my supervisor to return my overcoat in order that he may keep the law or as an act of mercy even. So you see this problem in the land of Israel. This is happening. Who will get angry for this person? <laughs> okay, let's move to chapter 3. Uh, before that, let's... Uh, See how God expresses this. They lie down beside every altar and in the house of their God. You see, he doesn't say in the house of God because it's under question which God is this that they are, that they are worshiping and whose altar are they? Definitely distancing, Yahweh is distancing himself from this behavior. It, this is not, even if they are in a temple, in an altar that they named that it belongs to Yahweh. No, I have nothing to do with that. I don't know them. I don't know them. This, they're in the house of their God. We don't know which God is. Definitely not the lover of the poor, which is Yahweh. Now, in chapter 3, to six, we have five words against Israel. Now we said the last, the eighth oracle was against Israel, but the rest of the book will be against Israel. So it was just an introduction to what he has to say to them. Um, now, we said yesterday that the program of Amos was iconoclastic. He wants to take whatever they have built, the images, their doctrines, their theologies, demolish them and rebuild them the correct way. So now he wants to reverse their favorite doctrines, the doctrines that make them feel comforted, that make them feel that God is with them, they are not you know, in danger or anything like that. And he wants to turn them on their head. So the first, things he, the first thing he strikes will be the doctrine of election. So let's hear 3, uh, 1 to 2. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. What does it mean, have I known? I became, I made a covenant with, I married. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. But here we would expect, you out of all the nations, you're the only one I have known, therefore I will bless you. Oh no, this was a very sudden reversal, a very sudden surprise of what one does when they enter a covenant, when they get elected from God himself. So election does not mean security, against every problem. It does not mean license to do whatever I want. Election for Israel means punishment. Why? Because you guys have tasted the goodness of Yahweh. You're not ignorant of who I am. You have tasted the goodness of God in your life and yet you rejected him. Amos claims you will be punished. Now, I want to ask you, how is this different from the unforgiving debtor in Matthew 18, 20 to 35. You remember the story there? Some guy whose uh, debts are forgiven, and what does he do? He goes and grabs and throws to prison the people who owe him. Will there be uh, anger against this guy? Is God getting angry with him? Is God going to punish him? Yes, this is what Jesus sweet, loving Jesus is telling us. It's the same God. This is no different from the unforgiving debtor story. So they cannot use the forgiveness, their election, 
the goodness that God has given, they cannot use it this way as a safety net and trouble others and oppress others. They were under the impression that election meant asylum. Uh, nothing can touch me. Um, perhaps they were thinking of verses such as Deuteronomy 7, 6. For your people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Yes, of course. But how did they read this? That no matter what I do, I will be his treasured possession. This is how they read it. Election meant that they should be different from other nations. They should be holy, like the God who elected them. They, however, heard only the flattering part, the convenient part, and they ignored the obligations of election. Now, this is a problem because the glorious past of a nation often creates a sense of entitlement in the heirs of that history. And this is something that many great civilizations of the world, the Greeks have it too, okay, they tend to rest on their laurels. We are this people, the, the, you know the greatness of our past? This is who we are. So there's no effort to be worthy of that past. You just rest in that past. And so a false image of ourselves is created that is unrelated to the current reality and what my, my, my worth in the present, what I'm doing in the present. Every Greek thinks they are Alexander the Great. Uh, and at the same time, for any problem that happens in the nation, they blame the other nation. They are the ones who caused all of this. It's because of them that we suffer. So this is a tendency that can happen to nations with a great and glorious history, and this is what happened definitely here. Now, um, we have a series of rhetorical questions. This is another technique that Amos employs in order to trap uh, his people. And this, the expected answer to these rhetorical questions would be a no. And what does he do? By this, by this technique, Amos is trying to show that it's very natural and common sense can be used to discern the truth. And when one observes a phenomenon, they can, they're very capable of imagining the cause of that phenomenon. So he begins, for example, do two walk together unless they have made an appointment? So when people observe two individuals walking together, common sense says that they encountered each other or they know each other. You don't see two strangers walk together. Yeah, one may follow the other, but when they are together, walking together, it's implied that they know each other, that there was an encounter between them. So it's common sense to think of the cause of this phenomenon. Four, does a, a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? We talked about the roaring yesterday. The author assumes that the audience will make sense, make these connections naturally. There is absolutely no reason for a lion to roar in the forest unless it found its prey. There's another example with a snare. Then in six, uh, the question involves cities. It says, when a trumpet is blown in a city, the city is, uh, so how does it say it? Is it, ah, uh, yes. Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? No, everybody knows that when a trumpet is blown in a city, it's an alarm. Something happens. You have to wake up and ask what is going on. It would be stupid not to react to such a warning. But at the same time, they are not realizing that there is a trumpet among them, the prophet himself. There is an alarm among them, and they're not yet reacting to it. But they are able to say, of course, when a trumpet is blown, you should be afraid. <laughs> so in a, in a sense, they're condemning themselves without yet knowing that uh, they, they are next. Um, 
what else? Uh, so if you know the, the genre of, of parables, for example, works in a similar way. You remember what Nathan did with David. He didn't go to David and said, you know, you are the man who uh, stole this uh, little gold and from the man who didn't have anything while well, you had everything. He didn't say that. He got David to pronounce the condemnation first and then he told him, you just pronounce the condemnation on yourself because this is what you did. So this is exactly what Amos is doing. He wants them to say, is a trump, does, is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? No, if a trumpet is blown in the city, people should be afraid. But he will continue. Uh, similar to question uh, 36, he says, whenever a disaster befalls a city, um, I'm not reading it correctly, sorry. Does disaster befall a city unless the Lord has done it? And they know the answer to this question very well, too, because in the ancient world, a city is never destroyed unless a god defeats the god of that city. Because in the ancient world, the cities had patron gods. Athens had Athena as the patron goddess. No city is destroyed unless its god is defeated by another god. So they know that if the town of my enemy is destroyed, it's because Yahweh conquered, destroyed the god of that city. Um, they have in their history many examples. Sodom, for example. God destroyed Sodom. Of course, it's Sodom that destroyed. It's, it's God that destroyed Sodom. Sodom didn't destroy itself. They have the case of Jericho. It was God who brought about that victory. A, a, a city cannot be destroyed if God doesn't do it. But you see, they are thinking of other towns that are sinful. They are not yet thinking that, oh, it's possibly speaking about Samaria. It's probably speaking about our towns. Now, Amos assures them with what seems to be a positive statement now that surely the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. Oh, they know this very well. What does this remind them of? Before God destroyed Sodom, he revealed this to Abraham. Right. Uh, let's find the text in Genesis 18, 17. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And this is the question that Amos is asking now. Isn't uh, the Lord, does the Lord do anything without first revealing it to his prophets? And they're supposed to say, no, from our history we know that the Lord will reveal to his prophets what he's about to do when he's about to destroy Sodom, for example. But it would never cross their mind that God is revealing to Amos that he's about to destroy not Sodom, themselves who became like Sodom. So Amos continues now with two more rhetorical questions. We mentioned them yesterday. Um, it's, let's go back to see them. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has. Who can but prophesy? Exactly. Thank you. Okay, so you can see the parallelism that we said yesterday. The first line and the second line how they are all parallel to each other, all these elements. So we spoke yesterday that uh, the prophet, now Amos is declaring himself as this prophet to whom God has revealed what he's about to do. He, the lion has roared, he called, he called Amos to prophesy, and this is what Amos is supposed to do. This is the call of the prophet. Uh, now, in the book of Proverbs, we see that um, we see a text that is very relevant to Amos himself. Because if he kept quiet and did not warn his people, he would be the one in the wrong. Let's go to Proverbs 24, 11 to 12. 
If you hold back from rescuing those taken away to death, those who go staggering to the slaughter, if you say, look, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay all according to their deeds? So he could have heard the lion roar, he could have heard the call of God, and just kept it to himself. But God has warned him, and he became afraid first from the roar of this lion. And so he became obedient. Now the next part is very interesting. God is calling for witnesses from other nations. Now the other nations again are getting involved. He's calling for witnesses from other nations to come and see the sins of his people. Let's read the text. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod. Ashdod is the Philistines. And to the strongholds in the land of Egypt. Oh, you guys <laughs> are coming in. <laughs> Uh, assemble yourselves on Mount Samaria and see what great tumults are within it and what oppressions are in its midst. They do not know how to do right, says the Lord, those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and strip you of your defense and your strongholds shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherds rescued Rescues from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear. So shall the people of Israel who live in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed, their furniture. Now the prophet calls the nations to come and see the disgrace of the elites of his people. Now the nations were supposed to be witnesses in the history of Israel. But what kind of witnesses? Witnesses of the practice of the just laws that God gave them at Sinai. Look at this text in Deuteronomy 4, 6. You must observe, and God is speaking to the Israelites, you must observe the laws diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples, to the nations. This is what they will be witnessing. When they hear all these statues, they will say, surely, this great nation is a wise and discerning nation. This is supposed to be the verdict of the witnesses of the other nations. Okay, but on the contrary, now the nations become the spectators alongside Yahweh of the sins of his people. So the elites of the nations, the officials of the unjust pagans, this is how the Israelites perceived them. So the leaders of the Philistines and the Egyptians, those who trampled for years on the people of Israel, they were their enemies, now they are coming to Samaria to, the, to sit in the elite theaters of Samaria to take their place on the mountain so they have a good view, okay, and sit on the bleachers of the stadiums there, and they get ready to watch the performance. Now before their eyes, they can admire those who manage to surpass them in evil, surpass them in hubris and injustice. Remember the Queen of Sheba who heard about Solomon's wisdom and came all the way to be a witness to this great wisdom and wealth and all of that that we heard about Solomon. Now these people are coming and they are, what are they witnessing? They're witnessing something that has surpassed them in injustice. Now, uh, the last part we saw is Amos using uh, an image from uh, shepherding that he knows he's very well aware of. This is his area. When a lion grabs an animal, one of his uh, cattle, uh, there's no way you can rescue it. It's, it's dead, like the lion is going to eat it, what you may be able to recover from the remains, the mouth of the lion, is maybe a leg, a piece of an ear, that's it. It's not that you will be able to rescue the animal from the mouth of the lion. No, you will be able to find some uh, proof that this animal was not stolen, but it was eaten by a lion. This is why it was very important for the Israelites back then, if a lion ate uh, someone from someone's cattle, 
to uh, get some proof, otherwise you may be accused that you stole it and you said, you know, no, a lion ate it. So you had to recover some proof. Remember Joseph's story uh, that the brothers took his rope, they slaughtered a goat, and they put blood on it. Why? Because they had to offer some proof to the father, to their father, that he was eaten by a lion. So this was the practice that you would do. What are they recovering? <laughs> what, uh, what is going to be recovered after God visits them with his punishment? Pieces of their very luxurious furniture, the products of the oppression of the poor. These are what will, what will be recovered. And actually, archaeologically, this is what has been recovered. We discovered parts of their furniture, of this ivory furniture. 